Tuesday, July 24th, and Plague is sweeping through the Level 1 studios. Chris is completely out. I'm dying, but I'm here anyway. <laughs> it's playing through the pain <laughs> like a true champion. <laughs> Can you hear? <laughs> You're not supposed to be able to hear me breathing. <laughs> you got that, that like gravel below everything you say because your lungs are just full of fluids. I hope it's not pneumonia. <laughs> <laughs> Krista had a flat tire Friday night and then apparently woke up to deathly illness. I wonder so. if that was part of the, it. Was like it was in the rain and I was like, see her, because she mentioned trying to fiddle with like her spare tire or something and it's like it was raining real bad. So it's like, I wonder if that's related. No, I suspect if one of her ancestors did something really bad right around this time. <laughs> <laughs> Probably it's, witchcraft. Related. <laughs> it's, a, it's a curse. <laughs> so this week we're going to start off with some good news, and uh, you know, I mean, it's kind of, it's kind of good news. This is one of those things we predicted that. It, so this is the EFF, and it turns out like things with the National Electric Code, you need to know what the rules are for the National Electric Code because there's like laws and stuff. Yeah, this we had that story about the Lexus Nexus stuff. That was last year, I think, right? Yep. Maybe around this time last year. And there's all these people who just do-gooders. I don't think they benefit financially from it at all. Who are going and finding these secret laws and publishing them. And they inevitably get sued. That's what happened here. But the good news is a judge has ruled that, yes, you can post the law. <laughs> because people need to be able to read the law. Well, if the law says something like, you're going to, you know... <clears throat> incorporated herein is like the Thomas and Bob reference for electric code and everything that the Thomas and Bob code says is incorporated here into the law for stuff that you have to follow then the Thomas and Bob thing is not really going to be copyrightable in the same sense that it normally is because the Thomas and Bob thing has to be known because the law says you have to comply with the thing yeah that was the same with the Lexus Nexus thing where they were putting notes in the laws that were then being interpreted as part of the law. Whoops. Which is, that's kind of weird by itself. You know, like, a little bit. Should, that, should the law firms be able to do that? But whatever, they were. And then they were saying, hey, we've, we've put this in, but we wrote it. So it belongs to us. And the same thing here. Somebody was saying, hey, we wrote this. You can't have it. Well, you can have it if you must comply with it. it is, it's crazy. It's like, it hey, nuts. here are the rules. Here's how much it's going to cost you to know what the rules are. I mean, that, you know. That doesn't seem like it should be legal, and this judge agrees. That <laughs> sounds very dictator, you know, third world tyrant ish. But here we are in the good old US of A. Now, this story, maybe we should tell, maybe you should sit down for this one. Maybe, you know, if you're drinking <coughs> something, swallow and put it down so that you don't <laughs> spit it everywhere. Because this is incredible. The FCC has likely doomed that Sinclair Tribune merger. Now, we've reported on this before. This is the thing that Ajit Pai basically rubber-stamped. He's changed his mind. Why did he change his mind? It's crazy because the rule change that he made had to do with the UHF loophole and giving them the ability to gobble up more stations. The rule is like you can only broadcast, was it like 39% of the audience? Like your news can only be 39% of the audience because if it's more than that, then everybody is hearing your version of the news. But they did something really, like, it's almost like they're like, well, Pi's got our back. We'll do whatever we want. <laughs> so they bought some, some sort of like shell companies, some dummy companies. And they're like, oh, yeah, this guy's in charge of the news now, not us. But they owned everything. They owned like the buildings and the equipment. <laughs> and, you know, they just put some puppet and in charge. We saw that YouTube video where all of these local stations had exactly the same spiel with exactly the same intonation and candor and it was like somebody made that youtube video where it was just a grid of like 200 people <laughs> saying the exact same thing and it's like wow this is i read about this in orwell's 1984 yeah so it's not dead but it go a judge gets to decide and i think every time in the past that's happened the judge has said no you think this is just a jeep pie playing a game of chicken so that he can get a raise and whatever backroom deal he's got mm, i don't know i think he got called out on it and it was so obvious, and he's under so many investigations, he might actually be worried now. <laughs> well, he should be worried because it's such plain <laughs> Yeah, yeah I don't, it's amazing. But 
you got to think they did invest a lot to get him to change all those rules. Well, I think it's really funny that our you know grandparents and great grandparents that put these laws in place in the first place were apparently so anti-government that they were like, you know, we don't need a system where a few companies can control all of our media outlets. That seems anti-American. And it's taken the better part of 10 or 20 years to tear all that down. And well, also it could be, you know, two, two, two steps forward, one step back for them. They're, they're playing the long game. They did get a lot of concessions out of those rule changes. And so then it's like, oh, you beat us in the end. Curse yeah. you. you know? And then two years from now, they'll do it again. And some more I, kind of uh, good news, I guess. Well, back to normal out of some really, really horrific news. <laughs> the, uh, by the time we got to this, the judge had already vacated the order, but uh, through a clerical error, a plea deal with a law enforcement officer was published on the Internet. And so the L.A. Times, a newspaper, published that. And then a judge was like, no, we got to take this down. Here is a like super secret seal injunction, temporary restraining order. Get that stuff down. So the LA Times is like, okay, but we're a newspaper. You can't do that. The story was about a corrupt cop who had taken bribes and a lot of his police work was in question because he was dirty. And he had taken a plea deal. He got caught and took a plea deal. I think it was just the details of the plea deal that was the leaked part. So you can almost infer... Everything else about it, you could kind of guess what it was, but the leak was exactly what the terms of the plea deal was, so they printed that, and for a while there, they had to take it down. They complied, but then this guy got, you know, the, the phones started ringing, and it was like, oh, just kidding. Well, it's, it's, so like, this is important, though, because think about the contrast between a print newspaper and the internet. It's like, there, it's like with a print newspaper, you're not going to be able to memory hole that. But with, no. the, with the internet, they're like, oh, yeah, the internet's different. Let's try to memory hole that. And that is dangerous thinking. Of course, they'd also point out that the, all the archive services already had it. <laughs> yeah. So they weren't able to change those. And I, I suppose it's still dangerous because most people don't know to check that. But, yeah, a, in a print, usually what they do is they'll print a retraction. And the retractions are on, like, the last page. In a, no one reads those. Eight-point font. And, yeah, so... At least he got caught. I don't, th I don't think it would have bothered in this case, knowing that the order was unconstitutional to begin with. Well, they said they were going to appeal it, and I'm sure they would have won. But how many months would that take? You know, nobody yeah. would remember yeah. it. Yeah, the judge time. at this point has already vacated it, so there's not even anything to appeal. And that's when it started getting media attention. It was like, wait a minute, this is blatantly unconstitutional. But I don't understand why we're protecting yeah. the details in the first place. Yeah. Why don't the people? Why should people not know about what this cop did? I mean, he was clearly corrupt. I don't think anybody's questioning that. Clearly criminal. It's a special kind of criminal. He's the okay kind of criminal. We're going to give that criminal special treatment. Speaking of the okay kind of criminal, how about the FBI? And of course, we've gone on and on about the FBI's assault on encryption. They want back doors. They want it now. And they keep insisting that there's a, a technological way to do this. Somehow there's some magical mathematics or special kinds of electricity that can only give the good guys access. <laughs> and, of course, the industry leaders are always like, you're an idiot. That's not possible. And he's saying, well, without some remedy in that vein, perhaps we need legislation. <laughs> the legislation is literally going to be Russia can get in your baby monitor at all times. <laughs> well, I can. And if Russia can because of that, then so be it. Because it's so I, dumb. I, I have to be able to get in. Don't believe anybody when they say that there is a reasonable way for encryption and actually the article also points out that uh the fbi was lying through its teeth about the number of phones that it can't get into because eventually they will be able to get into a phone even if it's got just because there's a weakness in the implementation i and, think they added a zero i think they reported eight thousand. it was 800 yeah so <laughs> that was a, a clerical error of course it wasn't you know that was just like mm, this number's it's not very impressive Let's nudge it up a little bit. This encryption thing does not stop good police work. And anybody that tells you otherwise is lying. They want it to be easier. They want it to be possible for an idiot mouth breather agent to be able to just push a button and hoover up all the data and then sort it out, sort out who's guilty later, which is not a danger. That's, that's sort of dangerous for a healthy democracy. Well, uh, that leads us into our next story. Now, before we talk about this headline, let me walk you through what happened in this story because it's an it's an incredible turn <laughs> it's a of long event. story so 
you have an FBI agent who is pursuing these two guys who he suspects of uh, dealing drugs. And I think they were dealing drugs, which is unfortunate because you got to get a, ignore that part. You got to say, okay, ignore that there was a crime being committed and look at how they went about catching them. You want better exactly. You want nuns to have been involved. It's like, oh, we accidentally scooped up some nuns. <laughs> yeah. So he was after these two guys. He found out that one spent time with his girlfriend at her apartment on like Sunday nights or something. He was very regular. So they go there and he was like, we just, I took a task force and we just went to surveil and decided to go knock on the door. Now, when he knocked on the door, incredibly, it just, just opened up. Wow. That seemed unlikely. Very unlikely. That's so lucky. I mean, if you're dating a drug dealer, <laughs> wouldn't you be more security focused? I've seen I've, in, in TV shows, there's at least three or four deadbolts and chains on those doors. <laughs> so, after the door, because normally you wouldn't expect a door just to come open when you knock on it gently, as you would. So he worried about her welfare, because something weird might be going on if she had an unlocked door, right? Oh, That's obviously. reasonable suspicion. If the door's not locked, there's going to be a chopped up corpse inside. So he decided to do a welfare check on this young lady. And in the process of doing so, he discovered a, uh, a stolen credit cards. And laying in plain sight. On the kitchen table. Obviously. Which is where you store your stolen credit cards. I, I know my stolen credit cards, I keep right next to my keys just so I don't forget them. <laughs> Pro criminal tip. <laughs> <laughs> store your stolen credit cards out of plain view. In an opaque envelope to signed with your, like sealed with your signature through the seal. And clearly labeled in large font. <laughs> stolen credit. So he also got a hold of a phone. Now he claims while they <laughs> were... You know, and looking at the phone, not they broke into it, but while they were looking at it, it got a text message or a call from this other gentleman that uh, they were investigating, miraculously. Hmm. So that they used as evidence that they needed to get this other guy. So that's when they got a warrant to stingray this other guy so they could figure out where he is. But it turns out the other guy <clears throat> was uh, an agent or something. No, he, he, was a, he was also a drug dealer, I believe. Well, oh, okay. allegedly. But the problem was, mm -hmm. the, this was a federal agent. And this, it was a local task force, a sheriff task force. But this guy was a federal agent. And it turns out the law in whatever state this was, oh, Kansas, maybe? I don't remember what state California, it was. California, I think. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, that's right, California, because they got those specific laws. The law says a federal agent cannot get a warrant from a local judge. Which is exactly what he did. Oh. So he sting, they, they stingrayed, they got the guy, and everything is, is going to court now. And their lawyer was like, you know, he took one look at all this, this turn of events and he was like, are you out of your mind? <laughs> There's so many illegal things you did here. And again, a win for the good guys. The judge agreed. My favorite thing in this Ars Technica article is that they actually have references to where the this type of investigation that has been used before, they have said that we had a confidential informant that told us something, when in fact it was an illegal, warrantless surveillance. Oh, they talked about that when that first came out. They had a word for it. I don't remember what that word was. Parallel construction. Yeah, yeah. And uh, pretty common. Yeah, that insanely common. And it also goes to show you, if you really had all of that evidence. And you had the guy's phone number, and you knew where these guys were. Somebody was telling you that. Do you really need to stingray at that point? No. I mean, I think you could work it out. Yeah. But it's like, we have to know. It's like, no, you don't. Come on. So that could risk the entire case. You know, these guys might walk, and they are probably <coughs> drug dealers and credit card thieves and so forth, but they'll probably get away with it because lazy feds. Woo. Yeah. This is all about being, all of this stuff that you read about is about lazier law enforcement and not actually trying to do a better job. And it's going to, it's, it's going to be, it's going to introduce so many security problems for the rest of us. It's just, it's a nightmare. Now this story, mm, I, I read it. I tried to read closely and I'm still can't figure out, is this a wolf in sheep's clothing or is this a Republican congressman who's trying to ride the ahead of that wave of backlash in the next election cycle because of net neutrality? The headline is, the GOP congressman introduces a bill to reinstate net neutrality. Now, the Democrats have already been doing that, but this, this guy's an outlier because he's a Republican, as you were, as you were sort of intimating. Yeah. So, the, the bill, like, it, 
they're calling this the open internet order, but this bill is less about net neutrality and more about just really, I would say, fairness in advertising. Like, don't call unlimited anything other than unlimited if it's not actually unlimited. Like, if you have a plan that's unlimited but it's not actually unlimited, don't call it unlimited. And you can sell an internet connection like based on speed. Like, I'm going to give you a, a six megabit connection. And how much you can download on a six megabit connection is dictated by that six megabit connection running twenty four hours a day, seven days a week for the billing month. The well, the worrying part here for me, and I'm, I don't re- so there's like the the four tenets of net neutrality that they always march out, and the kind of you remember the fake net neutrality that <clears throat> they tried to push through that was written by the telecoms. Yeah, that stripped out the two most important ones, which was the uh, fast lanes, and uh, I can't remember what the other one was. Just treating data packets fairly. It was uh, it was definitely like throttling based on something. This one puts those back, but oddly, the whole Title Two debate. This one creates Title Eight, hmm. and it's like, what the hell is Title Eight? And the Internet would now be Title Eight, whatever that involves. That doesn't seem like a good idea. I don't know. I mean, that's what I'm saying. Maybe it's a good thing, but it's certainly you know like the the argument from net neutrality people is the utility argument yeah and title eight would not be that it would be something else so. yeah i think that anything that moves us away from the utility argument is a disingenuous argument we need to separate the data that's delivered from its contents otherwise you get an impossible situation where like you know oh i see that you're ordering luxury goods from amazon that's going to cost you more than the same weight and volume of goods that are like sundry items it just seems dumb it's like we're going to open the contents of your packages and charge you, not based on weight or volume, but how much we think you're willing to pay to get your stuff. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, I'm sure we'll have more stories about that one. And <laughs> yeah. I, it, it bears more research of what the hell is Title Eight and what does it mean in terms of... There's all, they, they also went through like the massive hurdles that this thing would have to jump <laughs> to become a law. Yeah. And it's going to be a long time... They also, it has to go through a committee, the same committee that stripped the two tenants from the other one. So we're not going to get anything. I don't know. It's, that doesn't seem likely. It almost seems like we get a new, like, we're going to restore net neutrality story as every week, just like we get uh, Amazon AWS leaks. <laughs> it's like the same frequency. So last week we talked about the sewage sniffing robot that detected opioids. And we were we kind of ended on a cautionary note. It's like, hmm. You know, the government could use this. They could put it directly on a house and they could, you know, it's like, hey, show us your prescriptions and it could be bad. And how long until we see an example of that? Once again, the level one news is prescient. (laughs) Well, if you're in China, they're already starting. (laughs) The robots are linked up directly to your credit monitoring score. (laughs) Now, they, they are, what they're using it for is not necessarily to go after individuals, but they're doing drug enforcement in specific areas and they're using sewage monitoring to measure how successful it is. <laughs> how long, though? It's like, oh, you're a dissident? Oh, guess what we found in your poop? Or they just begin, you know, those things are probably not too expensive. So just put them everywhere. And then you know where to send the strike teams at any given day. Yeah. So a little scary and certainly something that I can see the DEA being like, oh, that sounds like a good idea. I like that. Let's yeah. do that. Let's get some robots. So, yeah. As we said last week, pro criminal tip, if you're abusing opioids, you're going to have to start using the litter box and just put it in your garbage can. You know, there was a local guy that uh, he was dismissed from his job at the, uh, the local university, I think, because he had uh, poppy seed bagels. And one of those quickie drug tests was like, wow, you are like opioided out of your mind and it was like no just he just eats poppy seed bagels from the local bakery every morning there was a i think it was seinfeld had an episode about that but they have proven that that (laughs) big big cash settlement he doesn't work anymore (laughs) so if you have a government job and they drug test just go hard on the poppy seed bagels and keep your receipts (laughs) and speaking of colleges wow we didn't even plan that how about again with china the old social credit system you think well how bad can it be what can they do to me if I've got bad social credit? Well, we found out can't get on a plane, can't get on a bus, can't get loans, things like that. Your kids can't go to college. Yeah, this is your the sins of the father. 
Or in this case, the debt of the father. We so, have episodes of Star Trek about this, <laughs> warning us that this is wrong. So he uh, he owed like thirty grand, I think, in dollars, and that he owed the father owed to a bank. But they, it's it's an important distinction. They ruled that he had the money. Yeah. So it's a different if you if you owe it and you don't have it, then you don't get hit as hard on the social credit as if you owe it and they think you have it. That's a huge tanking of your credit score. At the same time. According to this story, the father has started to make arrangements to pay back the thing when he learned that his son's admission to the school was in danger. Which, sadly, I think that reinforces it. Yeah. So they're going to be like, oh, that works. Let's do more of that. Yeah. Literally, uh, like a year or two from now, there's going to be some congressperson in, in, in your local government or some local government official in wherever your local government is that's like, Man, we got it. China's doing this social credit thing with technology. We got to bring that here because look at these positive effects. You know, I think maybe the one thing that'll save us from that is that politicians are almost usually rich, almost always rich. I mean, and uh, rich people are notoriously heavy in debt because yeah. they know how to play the, the rates. So maybe we'll be spared because of that. <laughs> Money will still control politics, but at least we won't have the social blacklist. Uber, this is uh, it's it's a new story, but it's not really. It's July 16th. It's been a long time since we covered Uber. But they were already embroiled in this whole gender thing. Although I think the one before was hiring practices. Yeah. Well, and this I, one is like, you know, harassment. I think after their CEO left, we made some predictions because didn't they go out of their way to do like the gender equality thing after the CEO? They did. But I'm not sure if this, I think this happened after that but the the explanation here is this woman was like this guy propositions me for sex every day and i turn him down and i make it clear that i'm not comfortable with that he just, just office me. banter I yeah. don't, why is this a big deal but he was apparently a, an incredible manager he like got the most out of all of his people oh, so well, they obviously. loved him and they wouldn't fire him so she's suing and uh we'll probably win quite a settlement if they're smart they'll settle that get it right out of the news because Uber is uh, plagued with lawsuits at all times. Now, Egypt is, uh, that's one of the countries we talk about regularly. They've got some draconian rules. <laughs> and when it comes to online, they, uh, they err on the side of caution, you might say. This is uh, also a microcosm. It's like we're talking about like the whole fake news thing, and it's like, who decides what's fake news and blah, blah, blah. And you guys, you guys playing the home game may say, on the surface, that sounds really well. Well, you should pay attention to what Egypt is doing for an example of how wrong that can go. Yeah, so Egypt actually registers websites that are going to be news sites. Like you have to register with the government and pay a licensing fee and do all that business. You can't just say stuff. That's crazy. Yeah, and so blogging is like a fine line. Like, how, who decides when a blog becomes a news source? Well, in terms of social media, Egypt has drawn the line. It's 5,000 followers. If you have 5,000 Twitter followers, for example, you are a news source. And you better not get caught with what they could consider <laughs> fake news. Not towing the line with the state, whatever. Yeah. <clears throat> this article has some examples of the fake news. And it, like Egypt is just off the rails because it's not. Yeah. It's, it's real bad for, in terms of like a humanitarian situation. Basically, any sort of, you know, talking about the government in any light at all that is negative is fake news in Egypt. So, uh, a lot of Twitter activists are going to be in trouble over there, I think. I wonder, what if you, uh, just every day you trimmed your, like you blocked people till you got down to <laughs> 4999. <laughs> they probably haul you off anyway. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> well, last week, the big story was the EU and uh, was it last week or the week before? But it was we, like they were threatening. Yeah, well, it was decided they were going to do it, but they hadn't figured out a monetary figure for the EU to find Google, and it's now $5 billion. I think they were floating $5 billion, but they hadn't... It was not confirmed. The paperwork... The ink wasn't dry, I yeah. guess, basically. But this week we find out the next big story, which is they've done it, and it's $5 billion. Now, this is from Reuters, and... Basically, this, what the EU is saying is that Apple and Google are different because Apple makes its own hardware. And Google doesn't make its own hardware. Google makes people that want to use Android on their phones follow a bunch of rules, and the EU has a problem with that. 
But it's actually like both the EU and Google are being very disingenuous about what it is they're doing or the players involved don't actually understand the nuances of everything that they're trying to do. Yeah, it, I mean, the, argu- the Apple argument doesn't make a lot of sense. And so, uh, another argument that they sort of float out there, which shouldn't matter at all, is the market share. Yeah. And Apple just doesn't have enough of the market share for them to consider going after, I guess. I don't know. But. Right. It, so, like, <clears throat> there is a... Like, okay, let's look at Samsung. Like, Samsung has a history of bundling awful crapware garbage applications on their phones that you can't uninstall or remove or do anything with. And it's also sort of problematic to get updates for a lot of these phones. Like the Android security updates and things like that are often languishing behind for carriers. And so like the EU, the EU regulators say that they don't really want to mess with that, but they think the carrier should be able to customize their phone and do some other stuff if they want. But as a consumer, I don't want that. Because I don't trust Samsung to not screw up my phone. But at the same time, if you want to run the open source components of Android, like I want to roll my own Android operating system and be able to do stuff with, you know, the apps, I can't do that. Google makes it super hard to do that. So in that respect, the EU is right. But in the Samsung situation where Samsung is wanting to take Android and customize it to be evil, I think the EU is wrong. Uh, Another part of it was the search Because Google, when you get an Android phone, there's this whole array of Google products that are integral with the Google phone. Yeah. But I think, I don't know, man, that's added value in a lot of ways. We'll put it another way. What if you had to use Bixby search and there was no option because it's a Samsung phone? I mean, what the EU is saying with their Apple argument is that's fine. And some people in the EU that are pushing for this law have said, oh, no, we don't mean it that way. They just need to clarify but there are other people in the EU that are saying, no, that's fine because that's just Samsung doing its own customization. But it's like, no, I don't. As a consumer, I want to pick. I want to choose what my search provider is. And I can't do that with Android exactly. I mean, I can kind of install some apps. But I also don't want Samsung to make that choice for me because they're garbage. A lot of people are predicting that this will be, because you've got those really low-priced Android phones. Mm-hmm. And newsflash. The reason you're getting those low-priced Android phones is because Google is use, you're using that suite of Google services almost always when you get those, and they're harvesting your data and they're selling it. They're making money on the back end. Well, if you if you take what the EU is saying completely face value, then Facebook could make the Facebook Android phone that does exactly what Google is doing, and it's horribly abusive from a user perspective. But that would be okay because it would be low cost and Facebook harvesting the data instead of Google. It seems crazy. But the point is. Those phones are going to go away yeah. because if if Google can't harvest the data and make money that way, then you might see all those Google handsets going the Apple way of like over a grand a piece because they're going to have to try to make money on the actual hardware, which they don't care as much about because it's obviously not their business model. But it's a mess. It's going to be interesting. I wonder if we're going to get EU specific Android. Oh, yeah. I would say we will. And and there's going to be... What do you think is going to happen when you get caught with a U.S. Android in Google (laughs) or in uh, in the EU? I think Windows M, I mean, the Windows without the bundled media player, that's how they dealt with that in Europe. I think Google's going to... If Google were smart, they would just go ahead and do that. But at the same time, Google is trying to stop the whole open source thing from catching on. And I think that's really what the EU should focus on. Is like, if you want to run an open source Android but still use some of the Google apps... Google would be compelled by law to like not make that situation difficult because they make that situation super difficult right now with the open source Androids. I remember when I was a young man moving to the next story and uh, right after I got, I didn't really care about politics when I was in high school. I don't think most people do, but then I got into college and you know, we got Bush and I was like, wow, Bush is that's, he's kind of weird. And then nine 11 happened and it was like, Whoa, I didn't care about politics until they were like, we can have backdoor encryption. And it's like, I don't think you understand how that works. <laughs> well, you know, 9-11, it was like, what, your freedoms don't matter because <laughs> scary things might happen. It was like, oh, yeah. And then Bush 2, I remember that election. And I remember being so crestfallen when he won. <laughs> I was like, really? Really? Because it seems like everybody in the world was against him. How did he win? 
Well, maybe we have a little window into that <laughs> in this next story. Motherboard says that the, this top voting machine vendor admits that it installed remote ac- It's apparently PC Anywhere. It's Symantec PC Anywhere. Is that even still a thing? No, well, they had to get rid of it after this was discovered. That's crazy. Why so, would you even... It's like, I need to log in to remotely access the voting machine? So the time frame of this was right before and during the 2006 election. Mm. There were voting machines that were inexplicably plugged in during the election. They had modems. They had to install modems because why would there be a modem in a voting machine? And so some of them had modems and PC Anywhere during the election, which is... uh, Now, these were not the the, the machines where you go and cast your vote. These were like the top-level machines. That that, count from the other machines. So they're connected to the other machines, and they report the ultimate vote back to... So well, if you wanted to rig an election, that would be where you would need Exactly, to. because it doesn't matter how the people vote. You report a different number. Neat. If you had unfettered access for some reason to the top level. And they, they did mention that it, they only did it for uh, a handful of, they didn't say how many, but they, a small amount. But when you look at the uh, electoral map, you only need, you know, maybe five or six to swing an election that was that close. Huh. So yeah, they've admitted to that now for a long time. They wouldn't admit to it. Uh, that was from motherboard. And every time it was like, we reached out to this company that built these voting machines and they did not return our, com- <laughs> they did not comment on our questions. So uh, I think they knew what they were doing and oh, it's so depressing. They claim that in the Later elections, this was not the case, but that's just one company. And it wasn't uh, Diebold or Diebold or whatever it is. It was another company. Well, the technology is such that we should be able to audit in a way that we've never been able to audit before, which should assure the integrity. So, you know, you think that they would maintain records from the individual machines so they could compare individual machines with, like, the aggregators. No, no records are maintained. Well, that was that story out of uh, Florida where they insisted the records be destroyed. Yeah. So I was like, why would you do that? There's no explanation that makes any kind of sense. But yeah, there we go. This this is a weird one. I, I don't think this is good news. Uh, we talked about, I don't remember if we've ever done a story about this. This might have been too long ago. Level 1 news might not have existed during that time. But the original story here is because of this photo right here. This is Tom Brady. A blogger or just, you know, like a civilian type guy shot this picture and uploaded it to Twitter or Instagram or something like that. And uh, it was used in a lot of publications because the story, there was a big story about Tom Brady and everybody was just like, oh, that's a good picture. Let me take it and use it. And so this guy sued him. And this, it, it, it shook out weirdly and they thought it was going to be appealed, but now it's, the appeals court's like, no, we're not. We're not looking at that. But the alarming thing is that embedding and linking uh, media is even more ambiguous than it was before in terms of like what's fair use and what would be actionable in terms of like a lawsuit. Yeah, the question here was before the rule was if you're hot linking it, if it's on my server and you're simply linking to it, then you're serving my content and that's okay. But if you steal it, put it on your server then that would be you taking my content. That seems okay. But they refuse to consider that because all these big major publications did just that. They took the image and cropped it and did whatever with it and posted it on their own server. They would have all been guilty of that. So this judge ruled in their favor and expected the appeals court to deal with it. The appeals court says, no, not us. We're not doing it. (laughs) Not it. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) This one, ah, now I'm on the fence here. Uh, the Senate wants an emergency alert to go through Netflix, Spotify, etc. I don't think this is necessary because it could just show up on people's phones. Well, they mentioned that. Yeah, I, my phone, I can actually turn those off, and I have. Yeah, because me too. I don't care. Now, I, the problem with the emergency alerts, they test it too often. <laughs> it's very annoying. Uh, the new versions of Android have the option to turn off only tests or tests and real ones. The other thing is, um, I'm not sure if these are included, but like you got the amber alerts, and then oh, you got yeah. those. Is it the silver alert? I don't care people? about lost children. Don't care. No, I mean, <laughs> I, I feel for you if you lost your kid, but or grandma. What am I going to do about it? <laughs> I'm going to go. I'm going to go and like peek through the blinds, like no, don't see them, and then what? That's, 
So yeah, this is a new FCC endeavor. I think they're trying to get back in people's good graces after all those fake alerts. No. But that, and that uh, TechCrunch brings that up. It's like, you're going to interrupt my Netflix binge with a bunch of fake alerts now? It's like, <laughs> no, no, I shouldn't have that. But on the other hand, you know, <laughs> if, if, you, if you save grandpa, is it worth people being mildly disrupted? It's better than regular TV because you can go back. You're not going to miss anything. I just I don't think that somebody sitting watching Netflix is going to be particularly useful for an amber alert or a blue, <laughs> blue alert too. anyway. Yeah, silver alert, whatever. It yeah, is. Uh, maybe. Uh, you got to wonder what that's going to cost. Yeah, yeah, because Netflix has to implement the protocol, and blah, blah, blah. and they probably have to give them some kind of subsidy to. I yeah. mean, you know, you can't make them eat the cost of that. And plus, all the new online services that keep popping up. When do you decide that an online service has to join the emergency alert network? Oh, well, immediately, obviously, because otherwise they're not allowed, I suppose. And speaking of the FCC, we all know that T-Mobile and Sprint are desperate to merge. How do you feel about that? <laughs> well, you can tell the FCC. You can post some terrible, terrible comments on the internet. <laughs> Just don't steal anybody's identity to do it. Yeah, they've opened up that famous comment system, and you can tell them what you think about T-Mobile and Sprint merging for the next, uh, you got till August 27th, so about a month. This is this comment is just the letter R followed by three hundred E's. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be great if they had a text to speech engine reading it to them. In the FCC lobby, it's like, what is that sound? It's like, oh, don't worry about that. Well, we've all experienced bots. So, sometimes they're a force of good. Sometimes they're a force of evil. But sometimes you don't even know they're bots. Maybe that's when they're the most dangerous. <laughs> this lawmaker is so pissed off. Because bots kept telling him terrible things on Twitter. It's like, I want, I want bots to force them to identify themselves. Okay. Well, this was a uh, uh, bail. Okay, so this guy wanted bail reform. I think he was in uh, California, yeah. And I, I don't know what he was trying to do. I don't know if he was, it seemed like he was making it less good for the bail bondsman. Like he wanted to, which was probably going to be good for the people being arrested. Yeah. I don't know. I, I'm not going to say that for sure because I didn't read the what he was trying to do. But he was trying to pass some legislation that had to do with changing the way bail works. And the bail people of one of his uh, one of the other politicians was an ex bail guy and had still had the company had an army of Twitter bots assault him on Twitter. And no matter what he would tweet, they would post links and like try to debunk it. But they were all bots. So he's saying he wants bots be forced to identify themselves as bots whenever they're used. Eh, doesn't seem like that would work. Now I don't see how. And already the bill has been sort of like twisted and detoothed. And at this point, it's just, if it has to do with trying to convince you to buy something or to try to convince you to do something politically hmm. are the only two reasons you would have to reveal that you're a bot. It would be a lot like putting a disclaimer on an ad. It's like this ad for political action was paid for by Putin. Just well, doesn't, doesn't seem like that would work. Yeah, Facebook's kind of doing that, I guess. And they also point out that uh, where is the line between I have a political opinion and I'm trying to convince you to vote a certain way? Because mm -hmm. elections are so uh, you know, topic-based these days. There's like one or two points where one is going one way and one's going the other. And if you make a if you say I'm pro-abortion, then you're pretty much taking a political side yeah. in the eyes of a lot of people. So, how's a bot supposed to know where the line is? <laughs> Julian Assange is going to be evicted from Ecuador, Ecuador's assembly, uh, <clears throat> embassy. And he's like, the, there's been some political changes in Ecuador, I guess, and they're not... President. Yeah, so the new president doesn't really like Julian Assange. He's going to be handed over to the UK authorities, supposedly. It seems like it's a done deal. They're just not sure when. Uh, he has done several things that angered them. He's even leaked some stuff about Ecuador, which is like, bro, <laughs> I respect your, your, you know, wanting to get the truth out, but you got to think about your own situation. If he goes, you know, if the UK gets him, for sure they're going to extradite him, and he's going to come here and face treason. I guess. Or... I uh, I don't. <sighs> This whole thing just doesn't, they're not really like super transparent about 
what's going on. Because as it stands right now, the UK police want him for evading the Swedish warrant, which has been dropped. Yeah, that case completely fell apart. So, well, that case shouldn't really probably have existed in the first place. No, that was totally fake. But, uh, I, you know, what is the UK going to do? Because the only, like, he can't be extradited to Sweden because the only, like, in an extradition order, you're only allowed to extradite for the thing on the thing. You can't add more later. So he's not going to be extradited. So does the U, has he been charged with something in the UK that hasn't been identified well, No, yet? he's been charged here with, uh, was he a U.S. citizen? No. So it can't be treason. It's got to be something else. Like, well, he, he's being uh, Kim.com'd. Essentially, yeah. <laughs> but I guess we'll find out. Yeah. Because that, but I think that they should at least be like, when we, when you turn over to the UK, this is what's going to happen to you. The fact that they're not doing that uh, shakes my confidence in the system because it's a little too cloak and dagger. Well, the other smoking gun about him being extradited here is that it, word on the street is one of the pieces of leverage that's being used is the U.S. is blocking an IMF loan to Ecuador. Yeah. Because they're keeping him. See, that kind of stuff is crazy. Why Why are we doing that behind closed doors in this day and age? We have the internet. Politicians cannot keep that shit secret. Well, he doesn't have the internet anymore because they've <laughs> already taken away all of his communication. And they use mobile jammers. I, if you work in the Ecuador uh, embassy, how annoying is it that your mobiles are jammed 24 hours a day? <laughs> because of sand. Wow. Yeah. So they're probably not voting for him. Yeah. Now... This is good news. Oh, um, speaking of you know doing it in secret, do you think that trial will be public? No. If he comes here? No, I no, think I he's, he's going to disappear and it's going to be like, we don't know what happens <laughs> here. He's going to be in Gitmo. He's going to be getting real close with a certain waterboard. And that makes me sad for like modern, like we have the technology to do this in the open, transparently. There is, I mean, if we're going to run a gulag, let's at least be open and honest about it. Let's <laughs> learn think, from China's example. I think by definition, you can't be open and honest <laughs> about a gulag. China's doing fine. I mean, China's <laughs> well, like... Well, they is, disappear, the, the well, bloggers and stuff like that. I mean, we don't know where they go. There's still, even those disappearances, they're more open about those disappearances than, than the West. Now, I've got amazing news. Let's say that you are a, uh, a modeler. You know, you create 3D models and skin them. If you're really good at spiders, if you make incredible spiders, then you're going to have a lot of work in the near future. <laughs> because VR is being used to cure phobias. Virtual reality cured my fear of heights. I read this and it's like, okay, that's cool. It's basically exposure therapy. So like exposing somebody to the thing they're afraid of makes them less afraid. And, uh, you know, I don't... Uh, I don't particularly care for people, but this YouTube thing has sort of helped me overcome some things. So I guess that's good. Now, this is the, the VR environment here. So you go through a series of escalating things. Like, first of all, you walk up some stairs that are overlooking these uh, balconies here. And you drop items off of the balcony. Uh, and then there's a, another step up where uh, you're forced to go out onto a ledge to rescue a cat. Which, you know, that gives you some interaction. And then ultimately, you see this guy down here, this whale. You got to ride this whale as he goes further and further higher around the building, which prepares you for the real world scenario riding whales, <laughs> flying whales. Exposure therapy is, a, is, it works for some people. It doesn't work for everybody, but it does work for some people. And that is, I they mean, claimed, that is a good uh, I think they claim like 70% of mm. the people, not 70%. Improvement, but 70% of the participants had like a 24 point improvement. So, makes sense. You do it over and over again, you get more comfortable with it. It turns out I still hate people, but I can tolerate it. It's well, fine. maybe you can, uh, you know, they'll do a VR crowd mm. and you can mill among them. Yeah. <laughs> but, like I said, if you're really good at spiders, start cranking out spiders because <laughs> we're going to need terrifying because that's one of the most common phobias. <laughs> and you're going to have a, a VR spider immersion game. I think people that are like super into scary movies is like, you know, experience the dismemberment through the VR. And it's like, this movie's great. It's like, you know. <laughs> well, that, I think uh, like running in fear games would definitely be improved by VR because you get you look around easier, you can peek. <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. So, <laughs> definitely be. So, now we've gotten into the, that was, we've, we've gone into hardware. That was VR hardware, in case you didn't notice. But now I want to talk about 3D printing and a huge 3D printing milestone. And this is pretty impressive because it's titanium. 
Yeah, I want this printer. This is crazy. It's four feet in diameter and made out of titanium. Yeah, this is a cap for the end of a fuel canister. So you can imagine this is dealing with some pretty extreme pressures, probably some heat mm. going in there, and they just are able to 3D print these things. Now, the, the amazing savings here isn't just the time you save by 3D printing, but if we look at this thing, normally it's, I imagine it's hollow on the inside. Yeah. Normally you would cast a four by four block of titanium and mill everything out. Yeah. So it's 80% waste basically. You could probably recycle the shavings, but still that's time consuming and they just, they can just print this and half the time don't have the waste. This is incredible. Level one 3D titanium printer win. And uh, what do you think one of those costs? About Millions of dollars. You think uh, more than a million, you think? Oh, yeah. And I imagine the type, what, liquefying the titanium, that's probably, it probably doesn't come with it. That's no. probably an add on. There's probably some kind of powder. The, the machine that there's a Canadian company that was printing from like Inconel, and it's some kind of a powder, and it used like laser centering to do its thing. So it's probably similar. It's probably a titanium powder. That's really good from a recycling standpoint, though. Like, if you have a production facility that's milling traditional titanium stuff, and then you take the shavings and turn it into a powder, and then feed that to the 3D printing machine, that would be like 0% waste. I wonder if the powder has any other properties, though. I don't know. That's, that'd be an interesting thing to learn about. Not that you could ever apply it outside of these. Oh, I'm sure we'll have things. people in the comments telling us all about it. But most of them won't have any experience with it. No. <laughs> if you want to invite Level 1 to come to your 3D printing facility that uses a titanium <laughs> printing, you can post. Everybody else, not so much. But we want to be able to 3D print titanium things and bring them home. Yeah. yeah. We've got, a, we've got some ideas. So the, it's, it's, a, it's a Ramvolution. <laughs> uh, how about LPDDR5? There's an acronym. That's a God, long this, one. This is got, it's got to be so embarrassing for Intel. It's like Samsung's like, we're making 10 nanometer RAM. How's your processors doing, Intel? And Intel's like, well, we're still poking along 14 nanometer. <laughs> and low power DDR5. Is this? I mean, I don't understand the timing here. Is this going to be before regular DDR5? Because... Yeah, I think this is probably going to go into like phones and maybe graphics card. Well, it's not it's not graphics card, maybe low end graphics cards. But uh we might see modules like this uh that are otherwise available on sort of like the next next gen stuff, but embedded systems are probably going to get this first. Yeah, they talk and this has two power modes. It's got like the extremely low power one and then the just low power one. So you can use it not just in your high powered phones, but in your Really low end phones. Yeah, and uh, they have, they haven't actually started. The, the foundries aren't actually cranking it out yet, but they claim they're close enough. And they're going to start in uh, 2019. The yields are high enough, which is the important thing. Which really says a lot about Intel's process because I mean this 10, 10 nanometer is not the same as Intel's 10 nanometer, but uh, you know every every Tom, Dick, and Harry can print uh, can do lithography at less than 14 nanometers. And poor little Intel, it's just. Intel's got a couple of things at 10 nanometers, but it just doesn't seem like they've got the uh, uh, the uh, the yields high enough for it to, to make sense. Well, last week we talked about Amazon and their possible white box networking switches and how <laughs> destructive that would be for Juniper and Cisco. Let me walk you through what happened there. A Cisco executive called the people at Amazon just in an abject panic, out of breath, can't breathe, cold sweats. I mean... He was like standing on the ledge of the building and it was like, tell me, tell me this isn't true. And the Amazon people said, no, no, we're not making a commercial networking switch. We're just making a switch for our own internal use. Which one could see how A could lead to B rapidly. Yeah. Yeah, probably what will happen is Amazon is not going to make this switch, but some company in China is going to be like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> Zamazon, a new Chinese company, <laughs> is going into the network. <laughs> yeah, Cisco. Like, honestly, the story here is not the non-story. It is how much Cisco freaked out because their their stock price went crazy, and like Cisco put out a lot of PR around this to be like, no, 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 correction, correction, correction. We, you know, and Cisco does work with Amazon a whole bunch, and so Amazon did sort of do them a favor here. But at the same time, Cisco's business model has got to change because 
it's there's not a lot of money to be made in custom switches when you can do everything in software now. And they don't even they don't even really understand what their customers want anymore. Well, balloons. You thought they were for birthday parties, perhaps storing heroin in your body cavity? <laughs> yeah? You thought their uses were limited? But no. They will bring you the internet. You can only be talking about Loon. Now, we've talked about Loon before. It's Google's crazy, like, internet by balloon. But it's in Kenya now. This one seems, like, semi-inflated. That's how it is with weather balloons, I guess. The one they show down here in the article is much larger. Oh, the images aren't loading in. Oh, there we go, yeah. So, uh, I don't know what's up with that. Maybe that was just a test. But anyway, this is going to be over Africa. These guys are going to be floating around, carrying wireless data hardware and bringing the internet to rural Africa. There's no mention of what it's going to cost and they will be, they will for sure be a monopoly because by definition, no one else has internet balloons in Africa. So the most impressive use of this technology I've seen has been in disaster recovery scenarios. Like a tornado comes through and rips up all the infrastructure and internet and stuff. And Google's just like, it's cool, we got this. And they yeah. show up with a tractor trailer of those. And they used them in Haiti, didn't they? Or not... Uh, in Puerto Rico. Yeah, Puerto Rico is what I'm thinking of. They used uh, these to get the internet back on. That's cool. Yeah. I wonder what the... Uh, it's polyethylene that they're made out of. I wonder what the, the life cycle of a polyethylene... Going straight into the ocean. But I mean, how long will it float before something terrible happens? Weeks. Months, maybe. I guess you make enough money. You I, think, I think they tethered them, though. I don't think that they're totally... I think no, they, they just, talk about the the unit has uh, it monitors wind patterns, hmm. and they're not they're mobile like they they roam. Hmm. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, uh, it's, uh, if you tethered them, I think you'd invite the possibility of people messing with them. Oh yeah, I guess if it's not tethered at a secured site, I think some uh, of the ones in Puerto Rico might have been tethered, but maybe I'm wrong about that. I mean, can't you see? You're in rural Africa. And somebody just, you know, drives the winch truck up to the, the <laughs> tether, winches it down and takes it. Yeah. Well, we did learn about that a few weeks ago where it's like they had the uh, the GPS tracker on yeah. whatever rare bird that was. And somebody was like, oh, my gosh, this has a SIM card. I'm just going to pop this in my phone. Oh, free data. Woo. Well, if you're hardcore into fitness, you probably got a Fitbit or what's the hot new one? Do they have a new one these days? I don't know. But anyway. Apple Watch? I don't know. People wear these things and it tells you if, you know, you're you're fit or not and how much in a given day are you doing enough stuff but they're not really super accurate they have a lot of gaps well now we have a new revolution in these things because we're going to track your fitness via your sweat <laughs> stanford is going to track cortisol levels out of your sweat because that apparently is linked to uh how stressed you are <laughs> i would get one but it would probably be it would go off at annoying times <laughs> now here's my worry about this because the, the stress hormone, when you're working out, uh, you know, you're stressing your body. But cortisol, if you're just like, you know, mental stress will do that too. Yeah. That's supposed to be really bad. So how long before police interrogations pop one of these on you? Oh, yeah. I'm sure that's going to happen. Yeah. And it's like, oh, he was stressed when we, we, we were asking him about that lost elder, elderly person. And it's like, guys, I was only stressed because I turned off the silver alerts on my TV. <laughs> or the, the chairs in the interrogation room, like the arms of the chairs will just have these built in. Oh, yeah. So you put your arm on the chair and it's like, oh, I see. Mr. Stress, what are you stressed about? And uh, yeah, that could, that could go really bad. This page is pre-scrolled and I don't know why. Oh, this was uh, this was a kind of a hot story this week, and I think this is a combination of of two Venn diagrams of haters, which I've I'm a part of one of them. It's the Apple haters and the AMD fanboys. <laughs> Business insiders talking about Apple fans are returning their new MacBook Pros. It costs a minimum of twenty eight hundred dollars because they can't reach the advertised specs. This is like the the debate between the uh, the new i seven and the i nine. MacBook Pros, and it's not, it's a little bit of column A and it's a little bit of column B. So it turns out that the thermal design in the new MacBook Pros is garbage, is unmitigated garbage. And the i9 will get hotter faster than the i7, and both the i7 and the i9 will throttle. 
depending on what your workload is, like how bursty it is, like it's going to be really busy and then the CPU is going to be idle and it's going to be really busy, the i9 might start to throttle quicker, but in general the i9 is still going to be a little bit faster. Well, the i9 at its fastest is in a freezer because... This, you know, on the back of the, uh, what was it, the, was it 32 or 38 core at Computex? Uh, where they were oh, freezing yeah. it. Yeah, with the uh, the one horsepower chiller. I yeah. think it was 38 cores. Anyway, know. you know, this is sort of that same thing where it's like, look at the i9 and how incredibly powerful it is. It's and it's like, cores. oh, yeah, it's incredibly powerful, but you can't cool it. Yeah, no. So I think the real story here that everybody has missed is that the, I would, I would bet that the Apple thermal solution was designed for a 10 nanometer CPU. But Intel has given them a 14 nanometer CPU. So it's putting out, I mean, these thermal problems are not new, first of all. They've been around since time immemorial. And these new CPUs are six cores instead of four. And there are other bigger, heavier laptops that have better cooling and they'll work fine. If I were going to buy one of these laptops, I would not buy the i9, having looked at the data. But it is. there are some people that have said the i9 is still faster than the i7 for some workloads. And that is not untrue. But bottom line, if Apple is going to say this, these are like super high-end devices and it's like, you know, the pinnacle of the computing experience, the thermal solution here should not be this terrible. But what's the price difference? Like 400 bucks. Yeah, that's, you're paying 400 bucks and you're not necessarily getting 400 bucks worth of performance because it's never going to run at its, the, the hypothetical yeah. performance that they might show. Best you. case scenario on tasks that take like 30 minutes to do, I'm thinking like rendering video and, and that sort of thing, uh, you're looking at a difference of like two to four minutes typically on a 30 minute task for $400 more expensive. It's like, mm -hmm. eh. Plus probably cranking out a lot more heat. Both of them actually will be hot enough to cook food. Well, maybe you could, you know, multitask. <laughs> the i7 versus the i9. It's like, I'm boiling, I'm making breakfast while rendering my video. Which one will cook an egg faster? There's a video. <laughs> and uh, speaking of Apple, last week we talked about the much maligned, actually for a couple weeks we've been talking about the much maligned Apple keyboard. And we found out that in the new one they've added a membrane that's supposedly going to deal with that. Well, uh, I fixed it, I believe, did a teardown, and to try to estimate, does this really fix the dust problem? And the answer is maybe a little. It's a, the more interesting story here, I think, is that publicly Apple has said the membrane is to make it quieter, but somebody leaked an internal memo, and the internal memo totally says, we're hoping that this helps with the dust problem. So I think that Apple doesn't want to say anything about the dust problem with the new keyboard because they're not planning to put the membrane keyboard in the old laptops. Oh, they've confirmed. <clears throat> they will not. If you, if you go in for the fix, you will not get a new keyboard. Yeah. So I think that's just Apple trying to avoid the hundreds of millions of dollars potentially of everybody coming back with like the, you know, MacBooks of the last, any, any MacBook with the butterfly keyboard coming back and saying, I need a new MacBook or a retrofit of the new keyboard on this MacBook. Which is why Apple would say, oh, it just makes it quieter. It doesn't actually make it uh, fix the dust problem. Which is really evil of Apple. And I fix it did point out that because, you know, the key has to get to the switch, there's always going to be some window for dust. Yeah. It's probably going to last longer, but once it gets in there, the same thing's going to happen. So, Well, that's it for this low energy episode of the news. I'm going to have some caffeine. We're going to try again in episode two. <laughs> See you on Wednesday.